and the next talk is by Dr. Anurag Kurpa. For official reasons, uh, I can just put it in uh, this brief biodata that Dr. Kurpa is a professor of physiology and the head of International Association of International Atomic Energy Association Collaborating Center at St. John's, Bangalore. He is a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians, London, fellow of the National Academy of Medical Sciences, fellow of the International Union of Nutritional Sciences. He chairs the Scientific Advisory Committee of Nutrition at ICMR, the Technical Advisory Committee of the Tata a NIN Center of Excellence at NIN, the ICMR RDA Committee, DBT Task Force on Public Health Nutrition, and the Nutrition and Fortification Scientific Panel of S FSSAI. He is also a member of the National Technical Board of Nutrition at Niti Aayog. He co-edits the Asia-Pacific Journal of Clinical Nutrition. He was associate editor of the European Journal of Clinical Nutrition. He is a member of the editorial board of the Journal of Nutrition. He is a co-author of Asian edition of Guidance Textbook of Physiology and has over scientific publications. But most important, I would like to say is two things. One is an outstanding clinical thinker. In fact, the reason why I called him was to inculcate a scientific temperament amongst us. And uh, I would like to ask uh, Robert to put in a speech. Ramesh, just to add to that, I think he's a ha one of the few handful of Vargadarshi uh, fellows of the DBT Welcome Trust. The DBT uh, Welcome Trust together with Department of Biotechnology has set up this uh, thing to uh, encourage research. And the uh, Department of Health Research and all was started in that context. And they created a few Margadarshis who are supposed to be the senior people who will overlook research and mentor. So he is one of the few handful of uh, Margadarshi fellows. And during my stint in St. John's, before going on to BMC, we used to have two of his junior colleagues regularly interacting with the department for looking after nutrition of all our children. And they used to regularly come to the OPD, to the wards and help us. Good morning. Uh, you can see the rush of people who want to introduce Dr. Anura. So then you know what a, what a special person he is. But in a, in a nutshell, from my perspective, he's a man who single-handedly transformed the research atmosphere, starting in St. John's first, set up the research institute, then at the national and international level. And the, the, the best part is, after he got it at its peak, he had already groomed the second line of leadership. And he voluntarily just handed over the leadership to them. And he has stepped away and letting them run it. That, I think, is a great quality of a, of, of a true leader. And uh, on a personal front, I remember his first lecture to us when we were undergraduate students in physiology. And then he just came in to the one-hour lecture. He spoke for 15 minutes, the first 15 minutes. Then he said, if you guys found that interesting, go to the library and read what you found interesting. It was unbelievable. This was 1987. It was such an innovative way of teaching. And all of us ran and we were so inspired. So it's an honor, sir, to have you here. Thank you. So I'm, while they try to set up my computer, I was, uh, thank you very much for inviting me here. It's an honor to come. Can you hear me at the back? Can you hear now? Yes. Good. So um, let me fill in the time while they fix this computer. I just gave it to him. To them. I, uh, two things maybe I can tell you. The first is that I was just looking on my phone. In December, uh, in Christmas edition of BMJ 2006, they said surgeons are the most handsome of all the medical fraternity. So I think uh, that's something good. All of you are here. Please read that BMJ if you can. Uh, one of the reasons that was given in that, the BMJ Christmas edition is actually an edition that has these kind of interesting things. They said surgeons spend a lot of time in air-conditioned and clean environments, and that's why their skin looks good, and they are better looking people in general. I don't know if that's true. They also said physicians look bowed down and uh, worried because they hang heavy stethoscopes around their necks, and they walk around just... So I don't know if you'll agree with me. The <laughs> okay. <laughs> but the second thing I really want to talk about, and while they get this up, uh, have you got the presentation? Uh, is 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 what I, I which which has fascinated me is is the whole topic of failure. 
I think uh, my talk today you'll see failure as a theme and I think uh, I come at it uh, with the same attitude. Um, I myself uh, uh, was a failure and here's the funny thing, you're all pediatricians and uh, when you see a child trying to walk and failing and falling, you never use the word that this child is failing, is failing to walk. You actually say this child is learning to walk. But somehow as you admit the child to school and then they start going through school, you begin to start saying, hmm, this child is failing. And this seems to be a, something that <clears throat> the school system seems to inculcate in us and then it becomes even worse in medicine. And I think my own example and this whole business of playing football is, uh, comes from my experience as a medical student, or finally a medical student, who uh, failed in obstetrics and gynecology for some odd reasons. And was that shattering to me? Yes, it was. It was shattering to my ego, not least because I was up to then a gold medalist of the university. It was also shattering to my ability to continue studying because I was studying medicine on a student loan. And as you know, banks don't like to loan money to failed students. So I had no money to pay my fees for my next semester. And at the time I could have washed test tubes in the, in those days the labs used test tubes and you'd have to reuse test tubes. So there was scope to earn money doing that. But I also was at the time very fascinated by uh, research and I, 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 I do, I, I, I did go to somebody and ask him, do you think you could pay me a research fellow salary in advance for the next six months so I can pay my fees and then I'll promise to work for you for the next uh, this period and he agreed and uh, he was a physiology professor and that's one of the reasons I eventually took up physiology but it never uh, stopped me from thinking about things around medicine and that's what I'm here to talk to you about today and I hope it will be interesting because there are two brilliant speakers before me both of whom were very thought-provoking and uh, essentially make me a little intimidated but I hope uh, I can do justice to this. So I'm going to tell you two inspiring stories of surgeons and in the middle of that I'll tell you how to play football. Both of them are very important for what I think is a curious mind. So this is the first person who when I was a medical student was pretty much a hero for all of us. He was Dennis Burkitt and you've heard of Burkitt's lymphoma and Burkitt at the time was, was coming out with these papers in Africa describing different things but you must think about Burkitt. He actually was as a child grew up in a family that was very interested in maps. He was also a bird watcher and he would actually draw maps of the, the, the territories of birds around his house. Eventually Burkitt became a surgeon but then decided he didn't want to practice in, uh, in England and he went off uh, to Uganda which was a British territory and when he was there he began of course to look at the geographic distribution of disease and he began to notice that many things happened where the temperature was equatorial and wet and that there could be arthropod born diseases that could link to other things and his most famous paper is this one which you all know is the Burkitt lymphoma which, which showed he should have been a pediatric surgeon I suppose but uh, he, he actually showed this picture and this is uh, dramatic because it, it shows the tumor in a child between that growth has occurred in eight weeks so it really took the world by storm and what was important was he began to say that this tumor occurred in certain geographic regions and it probably was linked to something maybe mosquitoes maybe arthropods like lice or ticks so he wasn't sure but Burkitt just a minute yeah Burkitt actually wanted he, he it was amazing because remember think about it you as young pediatric surgeons and practicing pediatric surgeons I mean eventually to have a cancer named after you is such a big deal and he had the lymphoma named for him. But when he, he used to talk about it and he went back to England and he actually spoke at a medical college and there 
there was this person called Sir Anthony Epstein who attended a lecture by this Bush surgeon, as he was called, who described how he had seen these cases in specific regions and in high temperatures and lots of rainfall. And Epstein, Sir Anthony Epstein at the time, was a virologist, and he was working on chicken cancers. You know, at the time, there was this theory that maybe viruses do cause cancers. And in chickens, they were looking at this. But Epstein just attended a lecture. And he was fired up by this. And he thought it must be some vector. And so he began to collaborate. And this is the key of good curiosity among all of you. You will never do it alone. You have to collaborate in medicine today. And so Epstein asked Burkitt, can you please send me some samples of these tumors from Uganda? And of course, Burkitt said, sure. And every case he operated on, he took lymph nodes, he took bits of tumor, and he sent it back on the British Airways airlines from, U from Kampala, Entebbe, to London. And they failed. They failed spectacularly. Epstein couldn't grow a single virus out of it. Till one day, the flight from Uganda was delayed because there was fog at, Ma at London, and it was diverted to Manchester, which was north of England. But that meant a whole day delay in getting those samples to the lab. And when Epstein saw it, it looked like that sample had gone all cloudy and it looked horrible. And he thought, ah, this is some bacterial inv invasion of my sample of fungal. It's all gone. But he just decided to look at it under the microscope. And to his surprise, he found enormous amounts of viral inclusions inside these cells. And it's just that extra time that had been given on a flight that allowed the cells to float off the tumor and allowed him to see these. And in fact, Epstein eventually worked with his, with his PhD student at the time called Yvonne Barr. And that's the famous Epstein-Barr virus that we talk about, which is linked to the Burkitt's lymphoma. But what are we saying, what am I saying here? That it is, a, it is really the ability to just sit and listen to others to, to relate what you're doing to what someone else is doing and to think about things. So this is my point, that Burkitt actually was a great hero for us because he had wide-angle vision. He wasn't narrowed down, and medicine today trains us to narrow down and focus. That's a good thing because it's such a complicated disease, but, uh, complicated subject and sub-subjects. But I think the wide-angled vision is terribly important. And so you had this, a wandering surgeon who was interested in geography. Luckily, a virologist attended his lecture, and they had a passion for relating to each other, a delayed flight and some mistakes and serendipity and persistence, persistence, persistence. That's the great thing about Burkitt and Epstein and, of course, Barr. And I think they should have got a Nobel for them, but they didn't. The only person who got a Nobel out of the virus-tumor relationships was Peyton Rue, who was doing his work with uh, chicken viruses in the, in, the, in, 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 in the past. I just want to continue with Burkitt, just for a minute. I think Burkitt actually saw so many different things when he went to Africa, so many different things. He began to actually see that the surgeries he was doing were very different from what he did in the UK. And Burkitt had a brother who decided, who was also a surgeon, who didn't want to travel out of the UK. So he stayed in the UK, and Burkitt wrote to him and said, Listen, I'm seeing cases that are all crazy, different ones. Let's do a case series. You record the next 300 cases you see. I'll record the next 300 cases of acute abdomen that come to me. And let's just see what the difference was. So they listed it. It took them two years to get 300 acute abdomens each. And, they pub and <laughs> Burkitt didn't give his brother any credit. He published a paper all alone. Uh, without his brother's name. I don't know if they fell, up or fell out after that. But what Burkitt found was that a lot of the cases that were seen for acute abdomen in the UK, any guesses what do you think would have dominated them there? Acute appendicitis. And of course, there's tons of it. And in Africa, what do you think? Not appendicitis for sure. Almost none. In those 300, I think they described three appendicitis. It was mainly a strangulated hernias. And it was stunning that there was such a big difference. And then Burkitt actually went to those British public schools in Uganda and 
looked at the cases there and they found appendicitis was rising. That's because they started eating a much more Western diet. And that's when Burkitt did the second big thing of his life beyond Burkitt's lymphoma, for which he's not given much credit, is to talk about the ills of this Western diet, which we all now talk about so much. It started with Burkitt. And he eventually, Burkitt began to collect stools and, you know, this is a terrible thing to do, by the way. By the way, that's what I was paid for as a medical student for six months in advance was to run after people pretty much like this, collecting stool samples. And it's not fun, I can tell you that. But th I, I felt, I just felt inspired that I was doing what Burkitt did in Uganda and it didn't matter to me so much, I needed the money, to be honest. So I, I measured, and Burkitt actually measured stool weights, he measured stool transit times, and I, as a medical student, was fortunate that we published these papers in GUT and in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, which meant it was good for me because my CV began to, to show up as a better thing as someone, and by the way, I don't like to use the word anyone, nobody fails in today's world, you're learning all the time. So I always say I was learning, all right? So, I just one more thing. Burkitt, this is what, I, I think what I'm trying to tell you is about curiosity. And Burkitt then attended a lecture. And by the way, that's why these conferences are such important things. And at that conference was yet another surgeon called Neil Painter, the first author of this paper. And Neil Painter was describing how he had a lot of cases of diverticulitis, diverticulitis and he used to treat them with bran, which was fiber. And you can see the top picture there, the top graph shows many of his patients before they took bran had bowel habits that were irregular or every three days or every two days. And uh, most of them were that's on this side. But after they were given bran, you can see all the irregular ones, two days, three days, one stopped. They started having regular stools once a day and they felt much better and he was presenting this paper and Burkitt just loved it because he said, now I can see what I was talking about, Western diet, because in those days the Western diet was a refined diet. There were industrial Britain, industrial UK was actually industrializing and they had created these vast roller mills that would refine, that would refine wheat, wheat flour, and it removed the bran. And as a result, people were eating more refined diets. And it was, for Burkitt, this was such an opening thing that he ran up to Painter and said, I've figured out why I'm seeing different cases. Is there something wrong with this? Yes? Can you hear me tapping this? OK. You're getting cute. Well, there's so many side stories to this, and I just want to tell you that eventually Neil Painter published this in the BMJ. But you know what? Do you think this is a good experiment? I mean, in today's world, we keep talking research methodology. I think if he had tried to publish it today, he would have failed for the simple reason that there's no control group. And today we say, where is your control group? You know, if you don't have it, not good science. But you know, his referee, the paper, this referee, was a person called Richard Dahl. Have you heard of Dahl? Okay, if you have, there was this, the, the big, you can hear me? Dahl and Pito got together and they came out with the first definitive paper that showed smoking was linked to lung cancer. That link between smoking and lung cancer was Richard Dahl. He was a big guy. He was a great statistician, a great epidemiologist, but a medical person to start with. And Dahl, his, his, his review is actually given. You can read it and he says, you know, I think this paper has faults. But his, his said, it's probably right. And that's the great thing about, you know, I think science is you try and look intuitively into these things to try and figure out maybe things were right or wrong. So this paper was published. And then, of course, Burkitt went on. Uh, eventually, I think Burkitt went on to, to talk about a second cancer for which he's not given that much credit, but he's, there was no name there. But cancer of the colon and its linkage to fiber was very much Burkitt's doing. So if you look at it, uh, Burkitt was such a great man and inspired me, and I'm sure he inspires all of you as well. 
So the lessons from this story are that we get two special, we get very specialized. I mean, you're pediatric surgeons. Within pediatric surgery, you further specialize and become even more specialized in different types of surgeries. And that's a good thing. I think it's required. But the point is not to lose the wide-angled vision that we started out with. And one of the things that happens, and I'm, I think I'm also guilty of this, is whenever I talk about research, I always say, what are the hierarchy of evidence which you use to change policies? And yes, your job as a doctor and research is what do you want to be known as? You want to discover a disease? Good. Because you discover a disease, you'll probably get a Nobel Prize. That's one thing. Second, you want to change the way people treat disease. And that is changing policies. So to change policies, typically you'll never do it unless you do an RCT, a randomized controlled trial. That's become the evidence base for everybody. The WHO, nobody is going to look at you unless you say, I've done an RCT. But the thing is, you get to pull down this path of RCTs. And that again specializes you. If you think about it, Burkitt, he went with case series. And I still think case series are a great way for you to begin to start discovering things. If you just start recording your case, even a case report to start with, and eventually a case series, I, I, I would not look down upon them. I see them as ways and means by which you tell the world about specific new things that are happening in geographic areas. And of course, finally, do attend lectures, all right? I want to tell all of you, these conferences are very important. You just meet different minds, and I think Ramesh is just fantastic for organizing this kind of a session where he's putting square pegs and round holes. I think that is fantastic, because without that, you don't get this wide-angle vision for doing things. All right, so how does this rate relate to playing football? You must be curious about that. Well, in football, any coach will tell any, a striker, run for the open spaces. And you must have, I, I, I'll show you what I mean. This is a classical play in football. I don't know if you've ever seen this play, but if you watch football, you'll notice that in general, you'll always have someone in the midfield at number 10 here. Can you see number 10? Uh, he's the playmaker, as they call it. So you have somebody outside on the wing. They pass the ball to the center, to a center forward, who instead of running towards the goal, as everyone expects, actually pass it back to 10. So you pass to 9, pass it back to 10 instead of charging to the goal. And then number 10 passes it into an open space, which you've got the circle over there and the striker is running towards an open space. That, for me, is research in medicine. Don't run to the ball. When you run to the ball, you actually land up in an ugly scrum, an ugly place where you get hammered, you get shot down to the ground, you get fouled. All sorts of nasty thing happens when you run to a ball. But if you run to the open spaces and you're collaborating, I think really you would do very, very well. And I advise anyone who comes to me for, so, for example, what I mean is, there are some popular things to do in research. It's the hot stuff. Well, of course, if you have a new idea about it, run to it. But if you don't, think laterally, and you might find that something actually comes to you. So, I've just drawn there what happens in many times when people play football. Indian football is very much like that. They charge to the ball. And you don't see clean football. But if you watch European football, and I don't know how many of you watch it, but it is a clean game with long passes and it's all pre-planned if you think about it. And you begin to think it's a choreographed thing. And they think as much as we do about research. So these are the open spaces. Please don't consider the open space as escapism. Many people think that way and I think they are very, very dull people if they see it that way. Open spaces are the place where creativity occurs. It is entrepreneurship. If, for example, in the last talks, somebody said, we don't have something, you have a technology, there's a collaboration and an open space over there, and I could see it happening. It was fantastic to hear the kind of discussions that were going on with CFTRI. And I, I think, you know, I hope something happens. A goal gets scored over here, if you can. And remember, in medicine, you'll never do it alone. It's, it's an intersection of disciplines. Medicine has become like that. So make sure that in, your, in this institute and your own institutes when you're there, don't say, oh, that's not my field. That's a lecture. I'm not going for it. Don't do that. Go for lectures. You just don't know what you will learn. It's relational thinking. It's wide-angle thinking. But that's what makes a curious doctor. All right. 
So let me tell you another story. And this is about yet another surgeon who was a Canadian, and this one won a Nobel Prize. So I thought I should leave you with some elevated sort of feeling of feeling good about things. So this man did win the Nobel, but was a failure to start with. He failed his, his first year as an art student, tried to join medicine, couldn't get into medicine because his eyesight was too poor, and the World War came along. So since the World War required doctors, he was allowed to enter medical school. He, he then went back to the front line, fought there, was, was a war hero, was awarded the military cross, really fantastic. Came back to Canada after the war and studied surgery and orthopedics. And he was working at the Sick Kids Hospital in Toronto. Could not get a job at Sick Kids. Perhaps he didn't impress them enough, but he couldn't get a faculty job. So he gave up trying to stay there. And all of us know how we love to be in academics. Well, he decided, okay, I'll become a GP. So he became a general practice guy, and he, was, he failed at that as well. He didn't have a great practice. And so as a result, he decided, okay, let me go back to teaching. So he started lecturing orthopedics. He started lecturing anthropology. He even started teaching pharmacology. He just loved to teach. He got an MD in pharmac. So the guy was all over the place. You think about it, failure or success? Tried so many different things wasn't succeeding, became a teacher. In today's world, many people would say, ah, oh, he's a failure. I don't think so. He was learning a lot. Remember, he wasn't just interested in medicine. By the way, this, have you guessed who this is yet? Well, he had an interest in aviation medicine. He actually designed, I don't know if you know, pilots wear a G-suit. So he designed that G-suit with uh, this Wilbur Franks. And, and the war, they were using chemical warfare, using mustard gas. So this guy, to test antidotes for mustard gas, would actually breathe it himself and then give himself an antidote to make sure he knew it was working. That's the level of interest he had. But he wasn't succeeding. He wanted to be an orthopedic surgeon. He wanted to teach it at sick kids. Didn't manage. Well, this is the man, Frederick Banting, of Banting and Best. Now, Banting had to teach pancreas. To students. Remember I told you he was teaching anthropology, orthopedics, <laughs> you name it, he was teaching it. He had to teach pancreas and he started reading about the pancreas and at that time nobody knew about insulin. He just, people knew something happened, insulin, you know, there's something in the pancreas. So Banting said, all right, I'm a surgeon, I can cut a dog open, I can get out the pancreas. So what do you do? Get the pancreas out, you put it in a mixie or whatever you can, blend it up, filter it, Hope for the best that there's some, tr some insulin left in that filtrate, inject it back into a dog and that was diabetic and see what happened. Nothing happened. They couldn't find anything in those extracts from pancreas. And the reason for that is that if you take the pancreas out, there's trypsin in it, it's going to start breaking down everything. So there's already digesting stuff. There's no insulin that's effective left. So that was what was failing so far. Then this Banting read a paper by this guy called Moses Barron, who was practicing in America. And he said that if you ligate the pancreatic duct, don't just remove the pancreas. Just get in there, ligate the pancreatic duct, the exocrine pancreas will auto-digest itself. But miraculously, the islets remain intact. So you get a pancreas which is pretty much destroyed itself by ligating the duct massive pancreatitis, but the islets were still intact. And then if you cut that dog open, take out the pancreas, do your mixy stuff, do your filtration, you will get a solution that contains insulin and you can inject it into a dog and see what happens. So Banting was inspired and he went back to Toronto and he went to this prof of physiology called McLeod. And McLeod had a very good student of physiology called Charles Best. I'm sure you read Best and Taylor Physiology. Well, Charles Best was that man. And they just cut open a dog and ligated its pancreatic duct and then mashed up its pancreas later and got insulin. This was a single experiment. It got them the Nobel Prize. If you go to a statistician today and say, I want to do one N equals one experiment, or you come to a funding agency, they say, get out of here. But the fact is, the Nobel was won on an N of one. And that's why I think, you know, creativity, it's just, it happens. 
It's just that we tend to put all sorts of rules onto research and I think we sometimes do a bad deal of this whole thing. But the fact is they won the Nobel and this was the experiment they did. That's the dog on top there. They ligated his pancreatic duct and then they took out the pancreas. And of course, when you take out the pancreas, the dog becomes diabetic and they inject that thing back and lo and behold, the blood sugar goes down. And they said, aha, there's something here. And of course, that didn't make them famous. What made them famous was that there was a child that was suffering with type 1 diabetes and about to die in one of the Toronto hospitals. And again, try and get ethical approval for this thing. Dog, pancreas, going to inject something into a child. And yet they did it. And then it just got into the press, communications, and they loved it. And that made them so famous that funding just came their way. But there's a long story to this. I think the important thing to also, I must tell you about the dog. The dog died. All right? And they died for different reasons, but that's something we always forget. That sometimes the real heroes is the subject. And we, we, we forget about that. All right, just remember, I just want to finish here. I'm not going to take too long. That Best did not get... Actually, that's a funny thing. Banting got the Nobel. McLeod got the Nobel because he was the boss, the HOD. His student, Best, did not get it. And so Banting got terribly upset about this and publicly said, I will share my Nobel with Best. And that's honorable people. Share the credit. Always collaborations, share. Nothing goes wrong with that. But his wide-angle vision, he was thinking of all sorts of things and he succeeded. So these are my final thoughts. You will never do anything alone. It's really hard to succeed in medicine and doing discovery research. There are two types of research in medicine, by the way. One is discovery, where you discover things, you do your case series, you do this and that, that's discovery. The second set, which is much better funded, is what we call validation. That's where someone has discovered something, some pharmaceutical company has made a drug, and they want you to do the trial to test it. That's validating discovery. So typically, a lot of us in medicine are drawn towards the validate, validation side because of the funding. But I think those of you who just keep practicing, keep seeing what you're doing, and keep making your case series, they are very good. So the second point I will make is that medicine, surgery, and research are what I would call a synthetic science. What I mean is this. There have been any number of committees I've sat on at ICMR and MCI where the whole discussion has been how do we teach medicine better? We're teaching it in silos. We teach anatomy, we teach physiology, biochem. It has nothing to do with clinical medicine. Then they go to path, micro, don't know what the hell it means. Yet, then you teach them things in clinical medicine. That's probably the worst way to teach, right? And well, they're changing it now, I hope. But the fact is that we still get fantastic doctors. How do we get fantastic doctors is because we learn one thing. And that is we learn to synthesize this information and bring it together. The best students and the best doctors are those who can bring together what they learned in physiology, pharmac, path, and then they build a sort of picture of a particular disease and they do so well. So we've not failed at all in teaching medicine. We, we criticize ourselves. We are in silos, we're doing it wrong. But the fact is we get great doctors. So it works because the doctor decided to make it work. Research is much like this. You have to just synthesize. You have to think how to bring things together, that wide angle vision. You need curiosity, you need collaboration. And most of all, learn to play football. I just want to end with this. The very three, three very important words which in medicine are horrible. It is, I don't know. You cannot say this in a viva. You cannot say this to a patient. It's like, no, I know what to do. I know. Medicine trains you never to say, I don't know. In science, you're saying, I don't know all the time. So you have to think in your mind, how do I bring these two together? So just start by saying, I don't know. I'll tell you, I, 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 when I teach, and Anthony will probably bear witness to this, students ask me fantastic questions, and most of the time I'm saying, I don't know. But really, most medical teachers hate that. They want to say, I know everything. I'm an encyclopedia. I've mugged it up. That's 
one good thing. It's good to be that way with a patient, and you, know, you have to be to create that, that, that effect. But eventually, I think if you're going to bring it together, three magic words, I don't know. Thank you.